Okay, here we go, guys. I've got a lot to cover today. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, we are talking about growing through acquisition and why it is the secret accelerator to unlocking growth, impact, and value for your business. And uh, that's what we're going to cover today. And I'm hoping that by the end, this is what you're able to, to take away is this concept, as well as some uh, next steps in order to get going to learn more and um, actually get started doing it. Okay. So why would we want to do that? And the thing is, is that despite the, the necessity and the um, um, desire to engineer a better way to start up, we just haven't been able to do it. Right. And so in other words, startups completely fail. Like, like only 10% of them make it. And in a minute, we'll start to see what that even looks like, right? So even when you're just starting from zero, the reason why you would go buy an existing business is because it's got established product market fit. It's got current customer relationships, infrastructure, and it's cash flow positive, okay? And so all of these things are, are what you're wanting to do when you, when you launch a new product or you, know, you launch a new website or the, the next part of your business that you're hoping to, to scale uh, and, and grow. And so the, one of the things that really struck me was that, you know, when I was an MBA student, I really thought that, you know, a million dollar business was kind of small, like something that wasn't even really worth looking at. But what I started to realize was that only 4% of companies in the United States ever exceed a million dollars in, in annual revenue. And there's about 28 million firms that make this up just in the US. Okay. And the thing that became very, very surprising is that this 4%, you can actually acquire one of the largest companies in the United States for about for about the down payment of a house, definitely less than like $100,000, okay? And as well as a bank loan. And the thing is, is that right now is such an interesting and critical time uh, to be able to, to look at growing through acquisition because we have a confluence happening right now of three things coming together. The first is that there is 10 trillion dollars in in business value owned by the baby boomers okay they are now retiring at eleven thousand per day and you know what what i'm talking about is this is the generation that owns more companies than any other generation in the history of mankind and 45 percent of business value needs to actually change hands okay so you have this massive massive transition of business wealth that needs to happen in order for the U.S. economy to, to keep going. Then you've got the, the the sort of proliferation of online business, right? That's also been happening uh, over the last, uh, you know, whatever, 20 years or so, 25 maybe. <clears throat> and so with that proliferation, the thing is, is when you couple that with the baby boomer businesses, those businesses never reached product market fit while, you know, online and online marketing was, was like established, right? We're clearly past the tipping point today. And so the thing is, is there's a very clear opportunity to kind of, you know, use the innovation of the new economy and sort of marry it with the old economy. Or um, what we do at Quiet Light is we actually help uh, online businesses sell their business. Uh, so you as a potential buyer could come there and, and look for online specific businesses to acquire as well. Now, the little thing that makes the really big difference is not actually all of those other things. It's that capital has never before been easier to acquire. So January 1st of 2018, that Small Business Administration came out and said, listen, um, it's really easy for us to give out like goodwill um, um, uh, based loans on, on acquisitions at, at, in sort of solidly middle market, like $50 million and up, right? But we're going to go ahead and provide the collateral to the banks so that transactions can happen sub $5 million, right? So there's a $5 million limit to SBA financing. And so the thing is, is you can go out and with a small down payment, similar to that of a house, you can actually um, take on a loan and acquire a business that up to $5 million, okay? And so, so um, um, the concept here is that we're actually taking uh, the same equity buildup uh, economics from real estate investing and applying it to, to acquisitions, right? Applying it to businesses. And so just looking at this graph here, 100% um, on that line is the value of the transaction the day you bought it. So let's just say that, it, you know, it's a million dollars, okay? You put in a 10% cash infusion, so you buy it for $100,000 in, you take a $900,000 loan. In year seven, assuming a 10% revenue growth, okay, you now own um, 100%. So you've turned that 100,000 into a million dollars in just seven years, okay? By year 10, you can see that 100,000 is worth a little over two, about two and a quarter million dollars, okay? So it's, it's a really interesting way 
uh, to think about growth because that chart right there is kind of what we all want our businesses to look like, isn't it? And the thing is, is that let me give you a quick example. So this is kind of what I just ran through. You've got a $94,000 business. We're going to buy a company generating $1.4 million in revenue. Okay. This is about um, 200,000 in, in uh, seller's discretionary earnings. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. 200,000 in earnings. <clears throat> so I'm going to grow revenue at 10% over this, you know, 11 year period here. And um, uh, I'm going to exit at the same value, same multiple valuation that I bought it for, for two and a half million dollars. And just over this time frame, I'm able to take that $94,000 and turn it into $5.7 million. Okay. Now the thing is, is that this is great if you're just starting out and you want to acquire your first business. But where it gets really interesting is when you know you've already got existing cash flow and you don't need this new cash flow that's coming from your new product that you're growing through, right? And so if you take all of that money and start to put it towards the equity buildup or debt pay down, you can actually you can actually pay this sucker off in four years. Okay, that's the economics here. The cash flow comes in. You take a salary. You 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 use it for equity buildup or you use it to. Uh, to uh, uh, launch new things, right? And so you've got this confluence coming together of, of the baby boomers retiring, uh, uh, the, the proliferation of online business and, and access to capital. And the thing is, is that like, when you actually look at buying existing companies, the margin of safety is actually far surpasses any other form of, of entrepreneurship at all, okay? So if you compare it to a startup, okay, we know about 10% of them kind of make it, most of those don't don't ever exceed um, uh, exceed beyond a million in revenue. Then you've got venture capital. What's 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 ver very not well understood is that seventy five percent of VC backed startups actually go completely to zero. Okay, and of the twenty five percent that are that are out there continuing, there's there's the, the the exits are getting smaller and smaller. Right. So in acquisition entrepreneurship, these are this is st statistics over decades of businesses that were acquired through SBA loans. The default rate has remained under 2% for decades, okay? Um, I, I gave the uh, um, uh, 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 talk, I gave, I gave a talk at the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition Conference at, at Duke University. I was a keynote speaker and the SBA, uh, the number one SBA lender in the country was uh, there in the audience and actually supported me um, on this slide. It runs about 1.5 to 1.7% um, 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 default. Now, about a third of these, um, who acquire businesses through the through the SBA excel? Okay, I mean they get they get returns that are that are that are crazy. And so because of this confluence, because of this margin of safety, maybe that's why entrepreneurship through acquisition has become the number one elective MBA class at every single school in which it's taught. But it's only taught at eleven schools, which is interesting. Okay, so here's the slide about who I am. So so I've done three startups. I've acquired over half a dozen companies. Um, I've I, I've enjoyed two exits of my own. Uh, I've got an MBA. I'm a certified M&A advisor. I used to be licensed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, you know, I've been published in all these places, Thought Leader of the Year Award at the Alliance of M&A Advisors, all this stuff. Um, I work with Quiet Light Brokerage, um, but I also wrote a book um, from uh, about um, um, how acquisition entrepreneurs outsmart the startup game. Uh, frankly, it was it was um, launched to critical acclaim. Forbes called it one of the top seven books all entrepreneurs must read. Um, it's used at many of the universities that we just showed up on on the screen, um, and it's done well. And so the point is, is this is a 30 minute talk, okay? And if you really want to understand the business model, um, um, I wrote the book that I needed back in 2004 when I first started looking for a business to acquire. Um, so but let's back up. What drives the value of your company, okay? If you really whittle it down, there's really six things uh, that make up the value of your company. But today we're really only going to focus on two, okay? And um, uh, here's how we're going to do it. Uh, sorry, we're going to focus on two, which is growth and earnings, which are the fundamental drivers of value in any company, period. OK, so we're going to start with what your company is today. OK, this is this is your company. It's what you're doing. All right. Now you go out and acquire another company. Let's just say it's it's of, of equal size. OK, well, now your company is grown by this amount. OK, so why wouldn't you want to do it again? Right. You do it again. But look on the side here. You start to see a difference in in numbers. What is this two to three X, four to six X? This, these are what's called multiples, okay? Multiples are, are um, sort of a stick in the mud, if you will, or a ballpark in terms of around where your business is going to be valued, okay? So in other words, um, if you were down here at the smaller company, okay, let's just say you had 
$500,000 in discretionary earnings, okay? Um, a, a decent, please don't put too much weight in these numbers. I'm making a totally generic example. But you know, if we took half a million dollars as your earnings, we might multiply that by 2.75 you know, after evaluation. That's a, that's a very plausible outcome. Um, and you know, we can probably sell this company for about $1.4 million. You know, raise your hand if you want $1.4 million. I can't see you, but I'm gonna raise my hand because I want I want 1.4, right? But here's here's where magic happens. Um, uh, we've got um, uh, uh, once we once we grow through acquisition, we now actually get up to two million in earnings. And so we've got um, we multiply that by six because now we are uh, being courted by institutional investors and and institutional capital. And so you know it's hard to grow from half a million to two million in earnings, okay? Uh, you might need to acquire a few businesses to do that and have some organic growth to do that. But look at what happens to the value of your company. It's truly exponential, right? And, and, and it keeps going. This is what's called multiple expansion, okay? So, so not only do you have all of the benefits of what we've covered in terms of, of uh, margin of safety and, and, all, all, and finance, financeable, bankable products, okay? But just by doing this, um, you start to get, you start to gain uh, uh, momentum in the in the value of your company. It is simply the single fastest way to grow your company. Okay, so I want to tell you a brief story. Uh, this, anyone know who this is? It's John Malone. Okay, John Malone uh, was the CEO of, of Telecommunications Inc. TCI. Okay, he was he was born in in the early '40s. Um, he was one of these like adolescent entrepreneurs who like refurbished radios and, you know, sold them, went to Yale and got his, his undergrad and graduate degree, like, you know, super, super smart guy. Um, you know, after, after he graduated from, from Yale, um, he got his PhD, sorry, in, in Yale. And after they took a job at Bell Labs, which was this sort of like, um, highly prestigious research arm of AT&T at the time. And after like extensive research and financial modeling, he went to um, he came to this like 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 really unorthodox conclusion, which was they should increase their their debt level and aggressively reduce its equity base via share repurchases. OK, and this suggestion was 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 both graciously received and promptly ignored by management because it was crazy. No one was doing this at this time. This guy like came up with this. Right. And so he moved on to McKinsey, like all, all good Yale boys. Right. Went and moved on to McKinsey Consulting, where he sort of fine-tuned his, his opinions on what made a good industry, and he ended up deciding on um, um, cable television. And it's because it really had three things that 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 he really liked. Okay, um, uh, recurring revenue. Um, it was capital intensive, which worked as a tax shield, and there was like this industry tailwind, right? Like it was it was a really fast-growing uh, uh, space. And so he ultimately came in at like 32 years old, joining TCI as the CEO. Okay. It seemed like a good decision, okay? It had good bones, but they were immediately blindsided by intense regulation from, from uh, the government and the cable stocks like cooled substantially. So TCI had debt at this time of 17 times its annual revenue. And so they were in a particularly precarious position. So in order to battle bankruptcy, he developed a, 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 an entrepreneurial um, 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 culture, you know, frugal, keeping the banks at bay, just focused on subscribers, okay? And despite the massive debt burden that he had to navigate, by 1982, he decided that the key to future success would be through leveraging size. So his strategy entailed minimizing pre-tax earnings so he could fund internal growth through acquisitions with the cash flow they were generating. So let's talk about what that means for a second. You're going to buy company A, okay? And you're going to do that. It's, it's, you're going to do this with X million dollars, okay? Whatever X is, just add zeros until it's interesting to you, okay? You're going to do a cash injection of your pre-tax net income from your current company's earnings, okay? Then you're going to take on some debt, all right? Now, the beauty of this transaction is that you get to depreciate and amortize the entire amount of that transaction, including the debt portion, over 10 years, okay? And you get to, you get to expense the interest uh, that you're using for, in, in order to get access to that money, which works as an additional tax shield. Okay, so depreciation and amortization, these are non-tax expenses. So why would you just do this with company A? Why wouldn't you do it with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, right? You wanna do a lot of these, right? But it doesn't look like this. It looks like this, where you've got, you buy a company, you spend a little time getting it right, operating it, then you buy another one, then you buy another one. And if you sort of remove the kind of like company stack in this graph, 
what you get is this like explosive growth, right? So John Malone had to come up with a word to 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 explain what he was doing to to um these other to the to the to the shareholders and, and the the analysts of the stock market. And he invented the term EBITDA. So for those of you who own businesses, you 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 might know what this is it's it's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, if you talk about earnings with publicly traded companies today, what you what most people mean when they say that is EBITDA because it sort of neutralizes for management decisions. Okay, and so this term was invented by John Malone because he wanted to do acquisitions, and earnings per share was the unit of measure used in the market at that time. What he was doing made no sense to people. And the, the concept here is it adds interest, taxes, and depreciation because he wanted to minimize taxes. He wanted to have some interest both to work as a tax shield and to get additional cap, um, um, access to capital. And he wanted um, um, depreciation and amortization, which is a non-cash expense. So it doesn't even matter. It's just a tax shield. If you had invested $1 in TCI the day John Malone uh, became, became CEO of this company, you can see on this graph they, they had tremendous um, uh, problems right right away. But by the end, it, it came out to um, uh, where is it? I know it's on this slide. Nine hundred and thirty three dollars, one dollar to nine hundred and thirty three dollars, all through growing through acquisition. John Malone acquired hundreds of companies during his tenure. OK, so the first company that I bought back in 2007, 2008, was doing about eight million dollars in revenue. Okay, it was it was kind of a massive acquisition for me. Like like I don't want you to think this is this is a, a normal first acquisition. It can be depending on on the circles you run with, I guess. But but this this was this was absurd. And the reason I did it, by the way, was because the SBA was not backing uh, uh, goodwill based acquisitions. And so I had to find something that had like a ton of equipment that that I could use as collateral with the bank for them to get comfortable. Okay, so this is what I bought. Um, in 2013, I, I sold this company, but the thing is, is, is from 2014 to 2016, I acquired five companies and went from zero to 8.2 million in just 30 months. Okay. So again, on the first instance, I got to 8 million in one day because I bought one company that was doing it. But you can see, can you combine these together in your head? That's like $16 million in like in, 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 in a short period of time, right? I sold the first business that I bought in 2014 and I, in the same way that I just described with you. And I got a 52% compounded annual growth rate in four and a half years. Okay. And the thing is, guys, is that, you know, I haven't just done this, like, like I, I've done this in distribution. I've done it in printing. I've done it in promotional items. I've done it in, in railing manufacturing. I've done it in, in um, uh, powder coating and I've done it in e-commerce. Okay. So I've done this. In, I've done this myself in all of these different, all of these different ways, all these different industries. And the thing is, is I, I use the buy them build acquisition process to do it, which of course we don't have time to go into in this call. But where are you going to find it? In the book. It's in the book, right? And the thing is, is that with e-commerce, and the reason why you know I own an e-commerce, I own multiple e-commerce sites today. And the reason I do is because there is an there's an online there's a an advantage to doing this in online businesses, right? Which is there's really only sort of three core competencies in, in online businesses. So it's advertising, it's sort of supply chain and like, like ordering when you need inventory and just, sort of, you know, doing customer service and making sure that you're servicing the customers. Right. And the thing is, is that like, you know, when I ran a printing facility, uh, you know, with multiple shifts and big equipment and all the rest of it, every time I wanted to grow, there was like these extra expenses that, that I needed for just overhead. Right. E-commerce doesn't really have that. Okay. Like, like, you can just grow and scale to your heart's consent, content because a lot of it is just sort of like, like, um, you know, marginal cost. Like, oh, I sold a product and so I've got a little bit more or like, you know, I need to, I need to get some money for, for, for additional inventory or something like that. Right. So, so the thing is, is that, um, um, you can do this and you are already in, in my opinion, the best space. And this is like the asset class to be in right now during COVID. Okay. And what you need to do is just start with changing how you think about what an entrepreneur is, okay? I want you to understand that entrepreneurship is all built around creating value and very often defined as starting from scratch, okay? But when you think about private equity, they're sort of like the epitome of, of you know, the investor. And this, this industry is worth trillions. In the same way, 
entrepreneurship is worth trillions, okay? But in private equity, there's a lot less failures. It has more to do with like market cycles and things like that, right? It's happened three times. I mean, they, they've, they've, um, they, they've had to learn it three times not to be over leveraged. And so you need to understand, if you're gonna play with debt, you need to understand the downside as well. Like I'm not, yes, I'm, I'm glossing over that in this talk, but, but uh, um, you know, we talk about debt very, very seriously. And so this, this AE is acquisition entrepreneurship and understanding that if you are the entrepreneur and the investor simultaneously, that's where that's where you can clench this reality and capitalize on all of these things. And so, really, there's sort of like two ways that you can, um, you know, get get deal flow, right? In order to like, how do I go out and sort of do this? And the concept here is that there's there's broker and and, and you know deal flow from brokers and there's deal flow um, on proprietary outreach. Okay, I feel very strongly that <clears throat> brokers are the single fastest way to generate meaningful deal flow. And the reason why is, is a few points. One, it's kind of one to many. So where do the CEOs go when they wanna sell? Hopefully everyone on this call, you know, when you are thinking about, hey, I need a valuation for my business, you wanna call me. Hopefully when you're thinking about, what is the process for exiting my company? Hopefully you'll call me. When you're thinking about like, okay, I'm ready, let's go sell. Hopefully you'll call me and us at Quiet Light, that's what we do, right? And so so the thing is, is, is you're going to, I will work with, with CEOs for, you know, a month at the minimum to uh, two years in order to, you know, go through valuations and exit planning and, and, you know, going to market and explaining all of these things. And so, you know, the thing is, is like, is like, this is where people go when they want to sell and they want to sell now. And brokers are the ones who usually do it. And the other thing is, is the sellers need to go through a mental evolution in order to get ready to sell. Because we all know that our businesses are worth like 20 times earnings because, like, you know, we bleed and we sweat. And at the end of the first year, we have like five bucks. And then we do it again and we get like half a million. And then we and then we do it again and we get a million. And we do it again and we get like a million and one dollar. And that's when it's time to sell, right? Is when growth starts to starts to slow on you. And so going to brokers is a way to accelerate uh, where that is. And if we have more time, I would tell you all kinds of stories about my efforts on proprietary deal flow. Um, but uh, I want you to imagine that someone walked up to your house um, today, knocks on the door and says, hey, are you thinking about moving? I want to buy this house. What do you say? You say, yeah, I'll move for you right now. Um, here's the price, right? You know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a price that can make everybody move, right? And so it's the same with brokers. Now, the thing is that I want you to understand, the private capital markets are completely unregulated, okay? So you might have a, a, a business broker that, you know, was like terminated from selling used cars because they couldn't do it well, okay? You also might have a, a um, uh, an investment banker from Wall Street who sort of like went rogue and opens their own M&A firm, okay? Don't get hung up on the terms. Business broker, M&A advisor, intermediary, investment banker, all of these names are, are really um, um, point to the same exact thing. Now, a Wall Street investment banker and a Main Street business broker are very different things. But I'm telling you, if you're looking for a business, then you know whatever the title of the person is, don't be intimidated by any of these titles. It's all just pointing to the fact that we help them uh, 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 exit, right? So at Quiet Light, um, the thing is, is that, uh, again, like, I bought, I bought over half a dozen companies over 10 years. I've looked at thousands of deals, okay? And the thing was, was um, I had uh, middle market firms kind of recruiting me to, to join them and sell these sort of like 50 to $100 million deals. And it just felt very corporate for me. I'm more entrepreneurial. And um, um, I, I had a business broker who, who decided at one point that I was gonna be his succession plan because uh, I bought and sold through him and, and he wanted to sell me his whole company. And it was like, okay. And, and I called Mark Dows, the founder of Quilight, and I said, listen, um, I'm good at this, but like if I ever was going to be a broker, like I would only do it with Quiet Light because, because they get it. And everyone at Quiet Light is an entrepreneur first. It's kind of a white glove service and you really get the best in the, in, in the, in the, in the industry. And so the, the point here is not to, to, to lay on a sales pitch hot and heavy. It's just that we're here to help you. If you want a free valuation, give us a call. We'll do that. Okay. If you, if you, if you are looking for how do I get an education on buying companies and start to look at deals and know what I like. I'm just telling you, after 10 years of doing it myself, you get the best listings from Quiet Light because we're so thorough and because we run companies, we're not bankers, right? And so we know where to go and how to vet. I mean, we get probably 200 inbound leads a month, almost that. And I mean, you don't see that that many on, on the site. So it's, we've got a, a pretty good vetting process. Um, in summary, 
Um, I just want to tell you that um, uh, Buy Then Build is my book. Um, the Acquisition Lab is sort of a um, instruction, uh, group coaching, do it with you by side kind of experience uh, that that I started just as a natural result out of out of Buy Then Build. And Quite Light Brokerage, of course, is 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 where we um, uh, help sellers transact. Or if you're a buyer and, and want to start getting deal flow, in my opinion, it's the best place to go. So um, if you have any interest in reaching out to me, I have two email addresses. And um, please help me keep myself sane. Uh, if you want to talk about selling or getting a free valuation or exit exit planning for your business, write me at walker at quietlightbrokerage.com. And if you want, you know, buy side uh, instruction, please uh, write me at, at walker at buythenbuilt.com. And we'll just kind of go from there, okay? Um, all right, that was uh, hopefully um, awesome. And um, that's that's where, where we are. So um, can I, we've got five minutes left. I can't believe it. All right, that was a lot of material. So um, if there's any questions, just let me know and uh, we'll go from there. Looks like Chris Moore. Our fearless, fearless CMO is, is in the chat room as well. Um, yep, we've got, we have uh, two brokers in, in Europe. And I'll tell you what, guys, we are going to, I can tell you from experience that the few minutes leading up to um, this, this start time, I got really nervous that uh, I wasn't going to be able to <laughs> log on and share my screen correctly and all the rest of it. So. Uh, if we've got a couple of minutes left, that's great. Chris and I are going to jump over into the Quiet Light booth, and um, we will be there for any questions, uh, uh, should you have any. The multiple increase will depend on what you buy as opposed to what just scaling. It's true. Don't just like blindly buy things, right? Like, so if you buy, um, like in my case, if you buy a distribution company and you buy a manufacturing company and you buy an e-commerce company and they're all in different industries, even if you put it in the same LLC that is filing one tax return, no one wants to buy a company doing all kinds of weird stuff. Like your company should have a strategy and a vision and a common theme. And the more melded together it is, the more it appears like one company and not like a bunch of different pieces in a, in a bag. Right. And so you want to have um, you want to create momentum and um, uh, like a common denominator uh, behind that. So um, great. Thanks so much for that question. Again, we're going to jump over into the booth and we'll see you, see you over there. Thanks so much.